Hello, everyone, and welcome to another ISTE Games and Simulations Hangouts on Air. Uh, today is Monday, October 12th, and this is part of the Connected Educator Monthly Series. Uh, and today we have uh, Chris Holden with us as well. He's one of our guests. We have uh, Dr. Farah uh, I should say Dr. Chris Holden, sorry about that. And we have uh, Kay Novak as well. Uh, I'm your host, Chris Lukes, uh, and I'm also part of the uh, ISTE Games Simulations Network. I am the co-communications chair, so sometimes you, you guys get lots of annoying email from me or my counterpart. Uh, and this is a really fun topic tonight. So uh, from your left to right on your screen below, we have uh, the aforementioned Dr. Chris Holden. Hey there. And we have Dr. Farah Banani. Good evening. And we have Kay Novak. So uh, thank you one more time for uh, watching before we get started. Uh, if you are looking at the uh, website, uh, the uh, GSN live stream website, uh, you will see that there's a Padlet there. Feel free to go ahead and type in your questions or comments. Our moderators will forward them on to uh, uh, other panelists. That way we can answer your questions. Uh, and also there's a little link underneath the, uh, the video there, so you can go ahead and click on that if you want a full page for the Padlet. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, I'll go ahead and switch over to some slides. So uh, I'll be right there. So uh, also, uh, thanks. We also have a metagame book club coming up, uh, and that will be starting in uh, November. Uh, we also have the uh, Eras Global Game Jam coming up uh, on the uh, 24th, and uh, we also want to thank the Inevitable Instructors Educator Gaming Guild uh, for all their help. And as we said before. There's still your name's getting mentioned a lot, Chris. Look at that. You got lots of <laughs> lots of coverage here. So uh, <laughs> uh, he's joining us from the University of New Mexico. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit about Eris Game Jam later on in the presentation. So the first question for all of our panelists is, what is a pervasive game? And Chris, we'll go ahead and start with you. Okay. Um, well, it, let's see. This is one of a handful of adjectives that, that sort of falls into the bucket for the kinds of games that I'm most interested in making and helping people make. Um, and pervasive to me makes me feel about uh, games that, that sort of bleed over into real life, um, that don't necessarily respect that living room boundary. Um, so one of the things that can mean are, are ones that are games that go with you wherever you happen to go physically, um, ones that that go wherever you go mentally in the sense of it's not just in a in a confined space like a classroom or a confined mental space like a classroom, but um, might get you involved with your family or making new friends out in the world, um, and then one that also bleeds over in terms of time frame. Um, so not a game that you play today or until the assignment's over, but one that you might pick up and keep playing for a long period of time or pick up again after a long uh, hiatus. Cool. Uh, Fra? Uh, I would add pervasive game is where there's no boundaries, there's no wall. We don't have to play the game here, and I think it blends in with the globalization that we can play outside our location, outside our network, and uh, it's kind of blurring the line between what is physical versus what is this virtuous area where we're playing. And I see it more in the game as well as applicable in teaching. Cool. To be ahead a little bit there. So, uh, Kay, <laughs> how about your definition? Okay, well, everything they said, of course. <laughs> so now I have to think of something else. Okay, basically, remember when Sherry Jones was doing the Metagame Book Club with us, and we went over Hasinga's like, magic circle, that you draw this circle, and that's the game, and that's where the rules stay, and how that's extended to like the screen where you are now. Well, Pervasive Games takes you past that. So it's no longer where you're confined in the box or in the screen, you might be running around with a screen, but it's getting you up, it's getting you moving, it's getting you doing things and, and having a different kind of experience. So, so that's what I'd add to it, because their definitions, of course, were perfect. <laughs> so as uh, Farah alerted, alluded to, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll start back over with Chris again. How can pervasive games be used for teaching and learning? All right. Well, so in, in some ways. I think it, it's a tool that I use to try and make my teaching environments, you know, the classrooms that I run, uh, the groups of people that I work with, um, 
make them be about something that's other than in that room at that time period during the day. Um, so hopefully, out of all the million things we may happen to do that semester, let's say, um, mm -hmm. something I hope will stick with a student and they will pick it up on their own outside of this formal setting. Um, and so I think pervasive games, the idea that there are these games that get picked up in this fashion and don't respect these boundaries are um, a, a nice parable for that, that broader concept that I want to try and cultivate um, in our relationships. So I, I think that's one of, that's a, probably the most important use that, that I see from them. Very cool. Farah? Um. I will say it's using the games to tear down any wall in the classroom and Kay and I have done it in my microbiology class. So it's basically taking the classroom and the learning experience and rather than that having it confined in this brick mortar area, it was taken outside in specific areas in the, in the campus and the student continue throughout the entire semester. There you go. Kay? Uh, what was the question again? <laughs> no, I'm only, I'm only kidding. Okay, okay. Here's how you use pervasive games. Use them everywhere for everything. Okay, basically here's and now here's the thing, because you know we do a big focus on authentic assessment. Get them out of the classroom into the environment where it might actually be happening. <laughs> And I see that Tanya Morton has given us a question. Is there a way to assess the impact of student achievement that was acquired? Why, yes, there is. And guess what? Farah even has a slide for it that she's going that she's going to show you. And the way, and, and and I'll leave it as that. And and God, these questions. Do you use traditional methods of evaluation? Chris, do you just want to jump us into into our slides and we can get into it? And we promise we'll go fast. And the only reason we have slides is because we'll be talking so fast that you won't be able to hear us. So, does that work with you, Chris? Sure, that works for me. Uh, or are you talking about to the other Chris? Okay, yeah. <laughs> that's what I mean. I'll have to distinguish. Okay, so let's see. If this is indeed showing up, everybody see slides? Yep. Okay, yep. okay. Farah, go ahead. Yep. Uh, I'm microbiology faculty, so I teach microbiology for the allied health and uh, future, uh, besides future nurses, so future MD or pharmacy students. So basically, it's a heavy curriculum, and of course, I I talk about my fun friends, microbes, and I like them, and I talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> and so we had um, it was part of the game, immersive game learning grant that Kay and I wrote, and we received it, and it was the project outbreak. We were trying to solve kind of develop the competency required in microbiology, cell biology, and genetics. I wanted to have the student to use to be those professionals, so I kind of like mimicking or using this epistemic uh, frame to act as microbiologists and as epidemiologists. And of course, uh, we give we give them different scenarios, and they were doing this virtual investigation. So that was mainly what was the main problem we we're trying to solve. And this is what we have done for a year and a half, for 18 months. And and I'll just I'll just take it quickly. Uh, I'll just take it really quickly. Yes, we were doing an epistemic frame for, uh, <laughs> for an epistemic game. And here's what we lucked out at. And while we created this, we would love to have our students create these games too. It's just because of the time frame we had, we had to create it ourselves. We lucked out. We went to the CDC and we saw we thought we'd have to make up epidemiologist interns. No. The CDC has an epidemic intelligence service. So what we did was just read a little bit more about what an undergraduate student who would be an intern would be. So that is what their site looks like. And then this is our site. So we even took their colors, their form, and we made our own site. We, we developed the Colorado <laughs> we developed the Colorado Department for Illness Prevention, CDIP. And if you Google it, you will not find it because it does not exist. But we made it anyway. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Quick question, Chris. Do we answer the questions at the end or as we go? You don't have to answer them all. I just wanted to write it down so that I could... Okay. I'll, I'll, we'll get back to them at the end. Thank you. 
and and yeah, and and you'll and we'll talk about what what some of them that that came that came across were. Um, we wanted to use an augmented reality, and for anybody unfamiliar with it, the augmented reality has a layer of of real world content, computer generated input through a GPS enabled application. Now there's some variations on this, but this is the the basic definition of what we use, and. We will tell you at that point in time we wanted to use what Chris Chris Holden will be talking about in a little bit, Eris. But we had some students who w might have have had Droid phones, so we really bootstrapped it. What we did was we t went and took and yes, this is a restaurant app. We took a restaurant app. <laughs> That at that point in time was not no was not very popular. We contacted them. We told them what we were doing, and it ends up now. If you go to our campus, you will see that there are that there are outbreaks attached to our campus. If if you go on to the restaurant app, okay. So like I said, we were bootstrapping. We decided it, we decided to use tag what, and they were very very nice about it. The other thing that we brought in was we brought in professional. Not professional actors, but but this is the former associate dean for for science and math at CCC Online. And what we did was we pulled up a Google Hangout just like this, had it in class, set up the mic, and had her introduce the scenario to our students. And when I say scenario, um, that's what we call it. As far as the students knew, what was going on was real. And what we told them that was that they were part of a grant project that we were looking at new technologies and new ways to teach microbiology and they were the pilot group and she was the director of special projects for CDIP and she was going to have students look at cold case outbreaks to see if there was global implications and seeing if something should have been missed and uh, any other kind of um, tests should, should have been done. So we did this straight over Google Hangout. Um, we recorded it so that we could put it into multiple classes because she couldn't come to every single class. Now, we also, when we wrote this up, we said we would use Web 2.0 technology, okay, and Web 2.0 quality. So we didn't sweat gorgeous, you know, gorgeous shots. Or making it it look professional or anything, we went with our cell we went with our cell phones, and this is one of my colleagues pretending to vomit in the quarter. He was he was um, patient zero for one of our outbreaks. Um, the whole video took 24 seconds. The angles are horrible. Um, it looks awful, but it looks exactly like something <laughs> that you would get off somebody's cell phone. So that was one of that was one of the clues. Here, here is um, Dr. Benani. Um, she was one of our other outbreak patients. Um, <laughs> um, the the thing about it is, um, she'll talk more about it. We wanted to go for global competencies. This was our administrative assistant who was was trying to see what the problem was. But what the students got when they walk the campus is they got to go to these places where there was geolocations of of people who who had potentials to be um, global outbreaks, and the and the reason why we could do this is where we're located is we share the public library and we're also on a bus route that takes you directly into downtown Denver. The bus route goes from DIA, so. <laughs> <laughs> and Tanya Martin is going. Do the students need to believe that this scenario is real? We and made it sound very authentic. Yes, I am not getting all the information that I provided in terms of the health part. And just so you know, this is the first time that anyone finding out that it was me. Besides, of oh, course. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was yeah. that was the mystery person. Is it required that they believe it? It it depends. I think it depends. I mean, for ours, if it, we did it so that it was a pilot, that that it was a pilot, so we were fine. If at some point the students asked us, were we really making a scenario, and we had to admit it, we were fine with that. I I've since done some things with anthropology uh, that we have done fake scenarios, and the students still have have loved it, have loved it, and played along with it anyway. 
Uh, <laughs> and we we had Chris Holden just just go ahead and make a comment. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'll read it. Chris Holden said, I'm always surprised how real they imagine very obvious fake scenarios are. And he, he said, it, he wrote that it's a little indication that they're ready for something <laughs> playful, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> So all, um, this was our first outbreak. Obviously, it was botulism, but these were the pictures that were found on the uh, on our victim's phone. And because uh, the way that botulism works, you get some memory loss, so he couldn't even remember where he got them from. So this was some of the clues that the students got. And I'm going to end up really a question. We do not have a link that has everything on it, and we and we are keeping it. How can, and we are keeping it um, behind the firewall so that we can use it <laughs> for certain things and so that our students can't Google it, but we'd be more than happy to share it with any anybody who wants to use it or look at it. Um, a big thing that I will tell you, and this is for me because I am the information and, tech, and, and technology literacy outcome mentor for our assessment at our college. We had a heavy emphasis on talking to students about the information and if they should believe every test, should they ask for second opinions, should they look to see if there's anything going on. So what we told them was that we called our project, not Project Outbreak, but MedTag, um, and we said that an algorithm, yeah, that a computer at CDIP had identified these cases that were likely to have global implications. And again, we had lots of discussions about MedTag, about what quantitative reasoning was, and if people should believe, and if people should believe everything and accept everything at face value. And now I will let Dr. Banani take over. Uh, I, I want to answer uh, Chris's question uh, right now in terms of what is the aspect of, of the profession. When we're giving them uh, those scenarios, so one that you act as epidemiologist and exactly how it is done in the real world. Kind of you here, there is an outbreak, you are sent to a location, and it is your job to do this uh, investigation. And the way how we have done it using the the, the app and geotagging the, the campus, as Kay mentioned, so. On specific days of the week, so we'll go to this location and I will give just a broad uh, kind of, they will see the video and I will give them some information in terms of, okay, here's the information that we have, rush to the ER, here is the age, and on purpose, I did provide conflicting information, both when I'm giving them the scenario as well as when we post the information. And the idea here also to explain that how many times patients have been misdiagnosed and it was their job to narrow it down to find out, okay, well, those symptoms do not match if I'm thinking about these microbes. Now, keep in mind, we introduced this when I start covering the epidemiology. So they have an idea what is the job of the epidemiologist. But now, they want it, I want them to be these professional epidemiologists to go and check this information and make it. Uh, but I, can I tell you that some of them have been pissed off, some of them like, oh my god, it is taking me a lot of time, but we wanted to make it as real as possible using this epistemic frame that we have. Okay, uh, is it for the Okay, so uh, we want to have this global per perspective. Now, uh, you can from the accent, I'm not in the US, I'm not in the US. <laughs> I wanted the student to, to understand that when we have any outbreak somewhere in the world, number one, they have to know what it is, and number two, we would we we'll talk about pandemic disease, the idea of a disease start in one continent and will be spreading in another one, and basically compare how it is done between one country to another one. So we had to have this global uh, perspective, as well as the scenarios when we divided, divided the, the section into a group of four, or three or four students, each one has been assigned a different country and each, each one has been assigned um, a specific scenario. So they have to understand and give the information on because microbes, some of them are picky, some are not. So it was part of this learning process to understand the fact that we have Ebola. When we think of Ebola, we think of South Africa and we, they will have to explain the reason why we're thinking of this country and how we can have it come in here in the US and explain. Um, we scared them a lot. <laughs> and those are the species that I have selected. And um, 
the following semester we have added more and basically I just selected the ones that are mainly most prevalent and I picked some viruses as well as some bacteria and those are mainly the more prevalent that, that we have. Kind of think of uh, the C virus, C virus. This is the favorite picture that Kay likes in my class and those are some of the pictures when we're giving them those scenarios. So the idea was throughout this semester I'm giving them more clues and they have to proceed by elimination and they have to um, again as the information match accurate on the CD and the FDA at the meantime doing the SLO in terms of the information technology in terms of they have to kind of okay uh, I'm hearing this I have to double check to make sure it is accurate and for 18 months all the case have been accurately diagnosed by this unit. Uh, back to Tanya's question, this is comparative between the green part, this is where, where we have used the game and the augmented reality and the pink one, those were the regular class and I was teaching different sections and one of them was the control, the other one was uh, the experiment, same thing for my uh, other colleagues, so this is combining six sections and this is a total of four uh, the, uh, six semesters uh, in a row and as you can see kind of the A we know the A students will always be an A student but what was amazing is we have an increase of the D as well as B students and we're tracking to see the progress of those students from the day we have introduced this experiment throughout all of those uh, semesters. In terms of uh, dropping the class we for some reason back to what Chris mentioned maybe because it was more playful we had less uh, student drop in the class so we have increased the, the retention student uh, success rate uh, they have been exposed to real life situation in a sense beside knowing the countries knowing that somewhere in the world things are happening they have learned the steps required to accurately provide diagnosis during any health outbreak and we talk about SARS how the little girl has been uh, diagnosed so we're using some real uh, situation with the scenarios that we have come up with and kind of that was the purpose uh, that we have uh, there has been um, difference in the comprehension, be, comprehension between students who were taught by using the methodology, the kind of the regular one versus the one using uh, the game and we have created si simulations of contagious disease and we help the student understand what is the job of the epidemiologist that all of us as microbiologists were grateful. They work hand in hand, both microbiologists and the epidemiologists. So here we, we surveyed the student at the end of every semester and I just want to share with you some of those feedbacks that we received. Um, I, I like this one in terms of okay, we're thinking how one, you have the influence that someone can become sick with the environment and the interaction with viruses and uh, bacteria. Uh, we had a lot so we just kind of compiled some of those scenarios that we have, some of the feedback uh, that we have. Uh, I love this one too, kind of rather than always me standing in front of them and lecturing microbiology, now it was their part to do the uh, the investigation and learn and share with us and they had to do presentation at the end of uh, each semester for uh, each group depending on the scenarios that they, that they had um, as well. Um, we had them to think outside of the box because there is no box in my class so I, so I like it <laughs> in terms of okay how can we acquire those microbes, what is the contamination and how, why is it very important to use and to basically work with the aesthetic uh, procedure and technique which is the key element in uh, microbiology. And uh, I'll I'm just reading the question that I have. Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump into um, um, Chris Holden asks us, oh, it would be interesting compared with the with uh, the game Plague Inc. I have it. I play it every day in my... <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, and I managed to wipe the entire world in 382 days so far. And a and, and, and very different point of view there, you know, take over <laughs> the world instead of contain. So, so, so yeah, I, th I, I, I think it'd be interesting to see which one. <laughs> so, so, um, so Chris, Luke, we'll give it back to you. That was our little bit about pervasive games, and now we'll let everybody else talk. All and right. This is a condensed okay. version of what we have done for eighteen months. We'll be happy to share with you more information. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So the next question for the panel is, uh, what? 
is an ARG, an alternate reality game. So we'll start with Chris and we'll go around. Okay. Um, so like I said with pervasive, alternate is another, alternate reality is another one of these adjectives um, that, uh, that we throw out to describe games that maybe aren't games as usual. Um, and I usually associate this particular adjective with, um, oh, why am I spacing on her name? Uh, reality is Broken, Jane McGonigal, mm -hmm. um, and the games that she made, um, particularly um, Isle of Bees, is that, is that the exact name? Yeah, yeah, that was um, the for, for the Halo 2 marketing campaign, um, where essentially they layer a vast conspiracy over uh, the world and all of its existing affordances, like pay phones, websites, um, physical space, things like that. Um, so creating a a game that takes place using the um, the bits and pieces of everyday life, but with the entirely different interpretations. Um, and then for me, this one is really close to augmented reality, which is a term I've always used more, but just because I've always used it more and has gotten to mean specific things on its own in the last few years. Um, but the idea being, and I think... Um, was it UK who, who already sort of gave the definition for augmented reality that you layer something on top of the... <laughs> um, yeah, so that, yeah. And to me, the only thing that I always try and remember about that is that it can be something sort of very technical and fancy, like, you know, all these tech demos where you hold up the phone and the phone's camera sees through and layers something on the screen, but it also can be real, a very different sort. So, like, Foursquare, um, now Swarm, I think is a, a very interesting augmented reality game. And it takes the bits and bobs of everyday life and creates a new game layered on top of it. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of things that maybe we don't think about as alternate or augmented reality, but that, that really are and benefit from being lumped together and thought about that way. So I guess that's my short definition. <laughs> All right, uh, next up is Farah. Um, when I think of augmented reality, I think of the movie Inception, where you have layers over layers over layers, and maybe because that's how we did how we did um, uh, the whole project outbreak, but it's more of how can I bring real life situation between quote and make it so real but yes I'm using augmented reality kind of I'm augmented for me is exaggerated in a sense reality because I'm trying to provide the student with this fictive scenario but I'm making it so real that they can blend within and think of oh my god this is happening because throughout all of those semesters there has not been any single student that has questioned the authenticity of those scenarios and what make it even more authentic, the fact that we invite you as a part of the, Chris Luke as part of the advising board as well as we had Dr. K, uh, Dr. M, and basically kind of having the Google Hangout, passing the, the, the mission and then when they come up with the, the result of the first scenario, the second so kind of quote, we send the information to double check if they have done properly the diagnosis. And again, invited her and going live, we made it real that the students were thinking, oh my God, we have this burden that we have to solve. And to me, we have achieved mission of making something completely inexistent using this augmented reality. And, um, okay. Okay, so if I'm going to take it, okay. <laughs> um, basically, if I'm going to say what alternate reality game for me is, I would say that if you Google ARG or alternate reality game, the, the difference I would say between that and a pervasive game is um, alternate reality games have kind of developed their own online community and a pretty strong online community. So. <laughs> And, and they kind of have a canon to it, you know, where it's, um, this is not a game. You always present, you know, you always present it seriously. You leave, a, you know, you send the people down the rabbit hole with whatever that first clue is. And you leave clues along the way and things like that. So 
when I think of it, um, an alternate reality game, I think of usually um, a that there's a community that leaves it a little more structured. Not that they don't love pervasive games too, because they, they write about pervasive games too. But I would say that there's a little bit more more of a, a of a structure. So so I mean maybe the difference between you know throwing the football and and actually doing football drills. But Chris wrote, um, Holden wrote something very interesting yeah. that I tell him to get on mic to go ahead <laughs> and state. Yeah, sure. So there was a, a question that, that the other Chris forwarded. Someone who's really excited about your the, the microbiology project you just or game you just talked about and is anxious to, to start something of their own. Um, but so so secondary teacher, um, excited about this, but where to get started? And and to me that's an interesting question for, for that one person but also for all of us in this whole business is so if you take this time and go down the rabbit hole for 18 months um, and make this game and run it and are excited about where it could go um, and we could talk about this with Mentira too when, when I talk about it in a few minutes but other than the usual well are the usual channels of academic output actually helpful in sort of getting other people to join in and trying this thing out and and I found them very limiting I mean you said before we started this conversation that's how you found out about the work that I'd done so it's not totally ineffectual <laughs> but I found that it's hard to give someone enough um, through something like a paper or a conference presentation to where they feel like they can really jump in um, so um, I don't know if people have ideas about how we share things. Um, well, well, quite quite honestly, we're, I don't think we're doing it effectively now. <laughs> and and I did find out about your projects because you know I went in and did a lit review and start when we were going to do Project Outbreak and I started with I don't even think I just started with pervasive games. But you know, eventually, as I was shifting through the game literature, I found I I found stuff on you. But I mean, I don't think most people people start there. So so, do you have ideas about how I'm? We're we're from the ISTE Games and Sims Network, and we're more than happy to tweet it out, send send it send it out. But do you have other ideas about uh, how we can get this out? Because I'm not sure we're doing it quite effectively. And the person who asked us about that question about um, English class, don't worry, we'll get back to that, and we'll give you some ideas too. Um, so I, I mean, one of the things is this thing that we're doing right now. So the way professional organizations have. Um, use their ability to be more nimble and to bring people together and to have conversations on a more frequent and sort of informal level than happens in, in conferences and, and papers usually um, I think is a good one. I think the thing that I've tried the most to do over the last several years is to force myself to actually share as much as I can as often as I can. So the things I know about how to use Eris, the things that I want to use Eris for, the games that I've made, the, the things that I've done in the classroom around these ideas, I try and write them up in tutorial form, um, together in a manual, in blogs, and, and at least put them out there so that they exist and they're not just in my head and between the, me and the few people I shared them with originally. Um, so, And I know that that's even when... Mm -hmm you see that as a necessary thing and have this sort of um, open mindset, it's still a lot of work to put it out there and it's not something a lot of people are going to get much credit for. But I, well, I think exactly. making sure that it's out there for people to find and, and that it's written for that audience of people that, that want to take it up and try it themselves. Yeah, one of the things Kate and I always uh, have talked about is is that you know we we need to have we need to try to find a way to slip in a session and the different professional development and conferences we go to for worst practices or failures, and so that way it's just when you come in and you say I tried this, this didn't work, okay, and you just sort of go through it and go these are my lessons learned from this because a lot of times we just focus on just best practices and what worked, but a lot of times there's there's a lot of lessons to be learned in that failure. There's a lot of lessons to be learned in those shortcomings that are there and seeing how that can go on uh, into future uses. All right. And if we're talking about the English person, okay, 
Um, here's what here's what I would do. Now you can think about the oh, and you're about to do Mentira, and I'm about to say murder mystery. Think murder <laughs> mystery, okay? <laughs> think murder mystery. Think um, urban legend. Think some kind of Sherlock. Think some kind of mystery to be solved that you can parse out the clues to the students along the way. And and we can talk about that more, but let's give it to Chris because we really want to hear about something. All right. I would also say that that for that particular subject and that age range of student, um, there's a lot of things like um, novice game platforms, whether it's something like Eris or um, Twine is a really interesting one too, um, or even something like RPG Maker, where um, making something of their own in one of these new media platforms, it also doesn't have to be games, um, would be an in a really um, motivating way to encounter a lot of the, the themes and tropes that come up, say, in literature, or, or that, you know, sort of usually we're trying to get them to appreciate from our angle, um, and that might be the kind of carrot that would um, reinvigorate some of those studies that, that students have sort of gotten used to and, and learned to not really engage in. Um, but all right, yeah. Uh, I will tell you all a little bit about um, uh, an important game for me. Um, it was the game, it was not my first game, but the first game I made upon coming back to New Mexico. It's called Mentira, and uh, it was a murder mystery. Uh, for Spanish language classes here at our university, fourth semester Spanish language classes. Um, and the idea, uh, this was made in collaboration with Dr. Julie Sykes, who's no longer at UNM, but you all will be happy to know is directing a team at the University of Oregon, and that team, among all of its other things, is also producing an, Air, an Android version of Eris. At this I, I know. <laughs> that was the big so thing for us. <laughs> for all the people that had to bypass it because it wasn't cross-platform. Um, and I can, make, I can also share some slides if I can figure this thing out. I have some pictures from Mentira. Chris, uh, I apologize. Could you remind me what you teach, please? Oh, so I teach in the Honors College. So um, we don't have a set curriculum. We teach interdisciplinary undergrad classes. Okay. And I'm sort of vaguely expected to teach one class about math and then one class um, about video games, essentially, every yeah. semester. Um, so right now I'm teaching a, a class on um, mobile game design as a way to learn about the city. It's called Local Games in Albuquerque. Um, mm -hmm. I also teach a, a game a class in the spring called uh, Games for Change, which is essentially an introduction to using games for uh, non-entertainment purposes. Um, but there are four um, students who have majors of all kinds, um, typically high-achieving students, so they're, they're sort of good at doing their homework and pretending to read the things that you ask them to read, um, and are scared by open-ended things like game design for the most part. For the title game for, for Change, did you have any trouble using this specific sentence, Game for oh, Change? You mean that it's like trademarked by the people that use yeah. it in New York? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've not received any cease and desist letters yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see if I can share these pictures with you. Uh, okay, it looks like it's switching. Yeah, we have it. It's working? All right, great. And then what happens if I go full screen? Do you guys see it now? Or did it just go the black? Full the full screen didn't work, but the other one did. The other one did. Yeah, now we can see it. Okay, we'll just do it in a non-pretty way. Um, Okay. <laughs> and and yeah, I will I will tell you we we did um for ISTE we did a not at games for change. <laughs> so so we kind of reported on what was happening there um, last year without being there, and then we even went in back and did some commentary on some of their sessions, and and one of those was Twine. All right, yeah, I Twine's really great. Uh, I. I definitely encourage a lot of people to use it. I think one of the things it also has going for it is as a production format, since it pumps out HTML and JavaScript, um, what you put out can be used by a lot of people, which is not true of a lot of these platforms. Um, in particular for Eris, you know, no one with an Android phone could use what you're using. All right, but anyway, Mentira was this game I made starting in 2008. People started playing it in 2009, and it ran through about 2013. Um, when 
uh, Julie Sykes actually left. She was not only uh, one of the PIs on this project, um, she's a professor in Spanish and Portuguese, but she was also the coordinator of the lower level Spanish classes. So she could tell them to use this and they had to. Um, so there's always um, institutional things that go along with these, these sort of crazy projects that <laughs> determine whether they actually work or not. So not having anything to do with the software, but just having the right people in the right place who actually want to try something new and different. Um, so our idea, um, we both had some background in games and learning. I had made some mobile games before, but we were looking at some of the games that were coming out for Spanish language learning, and they were flashcard games. Um, vocabulary, grammar, recall, um, the things that we all know and think of when we're thinking about language learning. Um, all the words you know and all the forms that you're supposed to know how to put to them together with. Um, and sometimes they were just unabashed flashcards like these ones. Um, but then even the ones that maybe had a little bit more gamification to them, when it, went, when it came down to it, they were still flashcards. They kept track of your scores and there was some physics involved all of which had nothing to do with the context of actually lose, using this language. So if you <laughs> see the screenshot here, this is like some African savanna, and I don't know what that has to do with Spanish, but I don't think the makers of the game did either. It has um, the word savanna, that's why. And with an A, they link it to Spanish. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this is just sort of, a, in a nutshell, our position about what was wrong with Spanish language instruction generally, that it was sort of, it cuts out all the cultural and context contextual components um, and just breaks it down to a very um, bland, short-term, uh, you know, sort of full literacy that students tend to pick up. Um, that it's not very efficient in terms of turning people into speakers and that trying to teach Spanish in Albuquerque, we could do a lot better. We have a lot of context that's relevant nearby. Mm -hmm. um, Spanish has been a language here longer than it has been in, um, or longer than English has been. So uh, we made this murder mystery that takes place at a, in a local neighborhood um, about 15 minutes from school. It's an old Hispanic village. There's a 300-year-old church there. Um, but it's just a neighborhood in Albuquerque. And the idea was to take this Spanish language learning instead of doing it in books in the classroom, actually go out and instead of making the game about recalling things that you're supposed to know we made a story that takes place in Spanish and that the students need Spanish to carry out um, rather than yeah learning about Spanish we use Spanish. <laughs> um, so this is back in 2009 we got a bunch of iPod touches which turned out to be really good devices logistics are always something tricky to figure out in each of these situations um, and handed them out to students and gave them to them for a couple weeks and they started in class um, and they they launched the game with each other and chose roles among four different family members um, or among members of four different families and depending on which family they were in, other families would treat them different ways and give them uh, partial information. And so each student on their own didn't get enough information to solve the mystery. They had to put together clues with people from the other three families. And so they started the game in class and then took it home um, and, and um, used a feature in Eris called Quick Travel to pretend to travel places. You would just touch on the map instead of actually going there and using GPS coordinates. Um, now the idea here was that we wanted the game to be kind of long, so it took place over a few weeks, um, but we couldn't ask them to actually go all of these places all of this time. About all we could expect from them was a, a two-hour field trip. So to make the game longer, we, we built in some fake travel. Um, and in this game, they would um, I can show you what the game kind of looks like a little bit. They would touch on those map icons, and then they would have these um, portraits come up and the, the people in the porch would speak to them, and then there would be some multiple choice style dialogue where they would respond to these characters, and depending on how they responded, they would sort of find out more or less about what was going on in this mystery. So um, a little bit of interactive fiction there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and, and then we would actually take them down to the neighborhood for a, a field trip where they would sort of play the, I don't know, the beefiest part of the game. Um, and they would walk around and maybe run into some spe people speaking Spanish um, and maybe notice that some of the signs were in Spanish and just get into their head a little bit that they were, they were doing Spanish outside the classroom. Um, 
and that was that was a neat and fun thing to do. And then uh, the very end of the game, they would go back, back to the classroom and um, put together all their clues and actually hold a trial where they would put one of the, the suspects <laughs> for this murder and then defend them using clues that they'd gathered in the game. Um, and the interesting part about that trial is it was something that, that uh, Julie and I didn't design into the game. Um, we thought we had this very clever ending where you find out that the suspect, the person who did the murder, wasn't anyone among any of the family members, and it, no one liked it. So they came up with this other way of ending it that worked a lot better. <laughs> no one likes the drifter logic. Yeah, the, the TAs and the, and the students came up with the trial. I think probably the third time they ran Mentira, and, and it was a real hit, and so we kept it in the game. Chris, uh, that yeah. happened with us with a, a game that we just did over the summer. We had the students develop it. It was very short, and it was it was about an orphan, and at the end she finds out, you know, her her ethnic heritage. And the students wouldn't let us end it the way we wanted to. We just wanted <laughs> to stop it, and they were like, "No, no, no, she has to find out she has family that's waiting for her, and there's a little bit of an inheritance so that she can go over to the back." country and meet with her family and there's one in the US so she has somebody nearby I mean seriously they weren't willing to let it go <laughs> All right. Yeah. So um, we had actually, in our original designs, wanted to incorporate student design a whole lot more um, in this project, and and we do in in all of our other projects. The idea being that uh, if any time we've made one of these games, we've learned so much about what we're trying to make them about that that uh, we would like to expose students to that that sort of very deep learning experience that happens through game design. Um, but in a required class like Spanish 202, we weren't going to have a lot of time and space to make that be mm -hmm. about um, much more than Spanish. So um, it, it was nice to have, we had to shelve a lot of our plans for incorporating student design in this game, um, but it was nice to see some of it come back through the back door. Um, just in the way of other sort of results or conclusions or observations. The game went pretty well um, and, and students took to it and it was building momentum and of course fell apart when the key person left the university, um, which, which is sort of one of the things to know about. In, in addition to like logistics with devices and technology and, and games and things like that, the logistics of personnel on the ground and especially field trips um, are things that I don't think scale very easily. Everyone's got to figure them out in their own way, and even once you've got them figured out, um, that doesn't mean they're always going to work that way. Um, it's it's a living process to be a part of. Um, let's see other things. I wish we hadn't put the beefiest part of our game during the field trip. I wish we put the field trip at the beginning uh, because the field trip was really cool. But we were asking our students to do a whole lot of reading out in the field. Um, mm. And what we should have used it for is this is the thing that they got from it, which was now I'm a person thinking in Spanish out in the world, and it's a Spanish-speaking world, and, and that just sort of makes me look at the world and myself and my fellow students a little bit differently. Um, so yeah, if, if we had to, to design over again, we would put the, the field trip at the beginning probably. Um, the other thing about Mentira that that uh, I guess is worth talking about is we designed it as a stepping stone to further work. So going on a two-hour field trip is not a, a deep travel into Spanish culture. Um, but that neighborhood is a relevant place. So for example, there's a, a local branch library um, with people who are sitting around all day hoping people come into their space and, and do something useful with it. Um, there's a lot of relevant stakeholders that we were hoping the Spanish department could see as, as sort of this game as the first step out into the community. Um, so I don't think about it as sort of a self-contained thing so much where we are saying, oh, did they pick up more vocabulary in this game versus just doing it in the textbook, um, but more as a way for all the participants involved to see their role in learning Spanish as, as somewhat bigger than they usually imagine it to be. Very cool. Uh, actually, well, I guess, we, um, just really quickly, in the question that you asked, um, have you found a difference in learning yes. students play versus students design? Just one quick statement is, uh, it was harder to get students to play than I thought it would be. Um, you know, the, the kinds of behaviors that you associate with gameplay, mm -hmm. um, trying things out multiple times, 
um, role playing with them. So we did have groups down in those Griegos that would you know decide to only speak Spanish to each other. But in the homework gameplay, we saw very little students treating it like a game, and mostly students treating it like a textbook. Um, and so more is needed than just the design of making it feel like a game to the designers. I think me and Farah had a similar experience um, with, and it wasn't the play part, it was the mobile device use. That we, I, I think that there is something that we have to break through to get them out of the, the role of students. Ours, ours was, um, uh, what I can't even remember the vocabulary words, but Farah was there reading from a file, like from this e, these ER notes and things like this, and there were, there were certain vocabulary words. Like yeah, this, I used the word, I remember, the first one was dysphagia. Yeah. And all of them looked at him like, what? What is this? And each one has a phone. I mean, yeah. can't Google it. <laughs> but here's the fun thing. The, the first scenario, when we geotag the place, is in the front of the door of the biggest library in the Westminster city, which is housed inside our campus. I mean, they can just go inside and ask for a dictionary, or at least find the, <laughs> the, the information. Yeah, and one of the questions I remember Kay was asking them, and then I gave the country, Slovenia, one of the scenarios were, were in Slovenia, and I'm like, some of them have never heard of the country to begin with. And then Kay asked, I'm like, do you know where is it? And then the group with whom she was uh, working, uh, they said, no, we, ha we have no idea. And then she said, so when you, what do you think to do? And then the student said, uh, we need to Google it. And then she said, OK, to Google it, what do you need? She said, <laughs> they said, uh, yeah, a computer. And she said, OK, have an iPad in your hand. <laughs> so it's this kind of a, the sequence of them to think that you have the entire device. You don't have to be sitting in front of the screen. Or you have the library right behind you. And yet, they did not manage to use it, so. <laughs> so. So it wasn't just play. I mean, for us, we weren't going, oh, play it. We were, we were just like, use the mobile device. And, and that was even getting it. Oh, we, yeah. have, a, we have a Minecraft, Minecraft. question. Uh. Now, Alisa, now, this is just my thing. Why couldn't the first clue, the rabbit hole portion, be uh, be in a on a Minecraft server? Why couldn't it be there? Or if they were playing along, why couldn't some clues be left there? Um, we we have not done. I can tell you, we haven't done one for a school that used this. But myself and some other people played with the idea of lose of leaving some clues in a virtual world. So, I mean, we've left clues on websites. Couldn't see why you couldn't leave a, a clue in Minecraft or a series of clues where they'd have to go back. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you can do it. Especially in science and math, by the way. <laughs> um, all right. So, let's see. I talked for a long time. <laughs> for a script, I'm supposed to transition to talking about other things. <laughs> I don't need to monopolize the whole conversation. <laughs> That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> well, there's only one thing left, right? The, yes. the Eris Game Jam, and you know more about it than anyone else, so you, you're going to have to talk anyway. <laughs> so, um, Mentira was made using a tool called Eris, and uh, we were the first people to make something other than a tech demo in it. And I got so excited and in interested and involved and, and enabled by that tool that I got really involved with Eris. Um, so I've been on the design team since 2009. Um, and in 2011, we got as many people together we could for a couple days and made games. And that's something that the design team itself We've done maybe about twice a year for the last five years. Um, and so once again, we've gotten ourselves together to share that with everyone else. So in a couple weeks, um, 
a whole bunch of people are going to get together and make games with Eris. And it looks like we've got Australia and Hawaii represented, but if anyone else out there is in another continent, um, we've, we, we need more continents. Um, Eris is, uh, we mentioned Twine before, but uh, you can make geolocational tours, games, um, this sort of multiple choice style branching storytelling that I showed in Mentira. Um, there's actually quite a lot you can do with Eris. Um, not Angry Birds, and not sort of <laughs> physics and geometry based puzzle games, but pretty much anything that can connect to a story you can make in Eris, which it opens it up to um, you know, a lot of things that, that teachers care that people learn about, um, whether, whether it's science or, or somewhere in the humanities or something like that. Um, and then Particular for me, geolocation means that we can go and investigate local place. Um, you can also create data collection experiments just at the drop of a hat with Eris. Um, I spend a lot of time um, trying to grow the community around Eris and making sure that people have the tools they need to get started without being directly connected to someone like myself or the rest of the design team in Madison. Um, so I would highly encourage people to play around with it and then start asking questions on the, on the author forums uh, as soon as you have them. Um, and to join us for the Global Game Jam, um, give, some, give maybe a couple of the tutorials a try. Um, I put some links in the document uh, to share with people afterwards, but you can go check out the manual. There's some tutorial videos I've made. Um, there's some stuff uh, about the jam itself on the homepage. If you do want to get together with some people and participate in the Global Game Jam, um, sign up on the website and that way we'll know to be in touch with you and to uh, we'll get together several times during the couple days and just share with what's going on at each of the different base camps. Um, so we'd love to have you. It would be a lot of fun. And, so we do have uh, one I question on that. Yeah. And is there is there a specific age group you're looking for for to participate in the game jam, or can any age game uh, age group participate? Anyone, anyone. Um, we've had middle schoolers make their own Eris games on their own for years now. Um, they need some help getting started, but once you get them started, they they tend to pick it up faster than the faculty members I often work with. <laughs> um, I have the most fun when we have different age groups together at the mm -hmm. same time. Um, you know, sort of people with different experiences and expertise all contributing together to, to um, something that's, that's for someone else to play, I think is just super fun and a great thing for people coming from different places to do together. Very cool. So one last thing we have to cover is the Denver 20, 2016 Augmented Reality Mobile Photo Quest and games and sim arg, so okay. Okay, so so that's just me. And real quick, um, I was just mentioning we we will be making an ARG and with the mobile learning network doing a photo quest in Denver um, for the ISTE conference in June 2016. So we are going to be contacting you guys to come and and play and play with us and help and help design this. So I'm just I'm just scrolling through the things, and these are our upcoming events. November we got the Metagame Book Club, December Hour of Code, and then to Spring 2016. That's Winter 2016 for our for our friends on the other side of the equator. We have a lot of things going on, and then of course we'll do another book club over over July and August. And if you want to follow this um, Aris Global Game Jam, the hashtag is Aris Jam. So on Twitter, go ahead and look for that. You can give them a shout out, say hi to them. You know, whatever your whatever your thoughts are, are especially if you're joining them. And that's just and that's just a screenshot of the different places. Um, we will be doing one in Denver. We're that blue star in the middle, but we we don't consider ourselves Midwest, but we're Rockies. Okay, we're not Midwest. Okay, <laughs> and next week we were, are going to be talking about ingress. We will have Michael Anderson from Niantic Labs, Michael Flood, our, our friend who started us along for the Mobile Learning ne Network, Cynthia Calgon from Colorado Technical University. They will, be, they will be our panelists. The other thing I wanted to say a shout out really quickly, um, in World of Warcraft there will be a breast cancer awareness. Uh, event where about 1,500 people will log in as pink-haired gnomes. 
Okay, and this will be happening on the same day as the Global Game Jam, but this is in the evening. So if you feel like joining us as a pink-haired gnome, come on and come and join us. We'll be getting more information out on that. And this whole um, series is from the ISTE Games and Sims Network, Mobile Learning Network, and it's all part of Connected Educator. We really want to say thank you to the ISTE Mobile Learning Network for doing Monday mini conferences. And of course, thank you to the Metagame Book Club and then our World of Warcraft playing um, Educators Guild who support us on everything. Thank you for having us. Thank you. No, thank you all for, uh, thank you all panelists for joining in. Thank you everyone that, that watched. Everyone have a great night and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks so much. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.